If you're trying to build a driving school, don't model it on a body repair shop. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, as a starting point to this conversation on integrative teams. So, you know, just to give you a bit of context to this and why we got involved to create the Practice Accelerator and really having this conversation about efficiency is there's, n there's not been any data on this in a big in a big way until recently with this IFM survey where they got a thousand practitioners to fill out a survey about what was going on in their practice and between the data from that and the data from Living Matrix which is the technology we're going to talk about in a minute they showed that there's a huge interest in, uh, in physicians in this space the patients and physicians are really satisfied but there is such systemic inefficiency and I think you don't need to you know, you can understand when I say inefficiency that um, about what that looks like. But the potential here is for happy patients, happy doctors, and for this to be a solution for chronic disease. But it's the inefficiency that's standing in the way. So, just to give you an example, they know now because of this, uh, because of the data that you know, on average, in this is in America, you have 19.5 patients per day being seen. Right, so that's that's just sec, you know classic ten minute visits, um, you know, uh, and otherwise. Now across with Living Matrix, now you can go across all the functional medicine practices, and you can see that the average number of patients per day in functional medicine is seven point four. And so you know we say the ideal model is twelve, and the only reason I say that because you can do whatever model you want depending on whatever structure you're building, groups or otherwise, is that if you take the salary, the average salary, or the average amount of money that a doctor does, here's the, here's the sort of dirty little secret, you don't make as much money doing functional medicine as you do doing regular medicine in America right now, right? That is a problem. There are, there, there are doctors that are making more, but they're not the average, and my, one of my goals is to make it easy for doctors to make more money than primary care, because then you'll see a gold rush of people going, oh, that looks like fun, let's go and do it, and then we'll have the number of functional medicine doctors that we need. I only, you know, I was talking to someone in the break, right now, there is an excess demand for functional medicine doctors right now, and the Cleveland Clinic haven't even proved the outcome, so I, imagine that what's going to happen in the next two years is there's literally going to be like a turf war where everyone's going to want to employ doctors who are trained in the operating system because if you're a payer or if you're a, another organization you're going to want to bring this into the organization you're going to need someone who's trained in it so the demand I think is 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 only going up but the reason why I say these numbers 12 is because if you if you if you if you uh, Divide the amount of money you make by the by number of patients you see. Functional medicine definitely makes more per patient. That shouldn't surprise anyone. But then, if you can get from 7.4 to 12, which is a 53% increase, you will make more money than primary care. So that's the goal. How do we still maintain or create high quality of care? Um, and uh, to be able to, to deliver it. So we're going to talk about, first of all, efficiency through provider teams. And I, I'm a new, new position in medicine. In fact, this is not from medicine at all. The health coach comes from business. Um, business worked out 20 years before medicine that if you wanted to improve the bottom line of a business, you needed to change the behavior of the employees. So coaching became a thing in like the 80s in business. And then it was really only in this century where they started to say, hey, we need this in medicine too because we need behavior change. It wasn't needed before, but now in the new model it definitely is. So this health coach role, and this could be played by a health coach, it could be played by a functional medicine health coach, it could be played by a naturopathic doctor, it could be played by a number of different providers nutritionist, dietitian, I'm talking about implementing the plans, facilitating the behavior change, running the technology, doing the patient education, and even doing the intake agreements. I was sharing with someone here earlier that in some of the most progressive clinics that we're seeing right now, you don't get, if the doctor is kind of the pseudo-celebrity in the practice, you don't get to see the doctor unless you've sat with someone and made agreements about who is the patient, you know, who's in charge of this health process, like who is going to be responsible for the increase in health that's going to come? Because that really, you know, there's an assumption, you may have an assumption that, oh, people know that they're responsible for their own health. No, they don't. Like this is be being drummed into them that the doctor is going to save them. If you, if you are of an opinion that they're going to do the majority of the heavy lifting to get themselves well, which in any of these participatory medicine systems is, is necessary, you need to get that agreement and probably get it on paper.
right, from the patient. So, you know, imagine if you could come back to your second or third appointment, they're like, oh, I didn't get well, and you could come back to their initial agreement that they said, hey, I'm going to only eat this stuff, I'm going to, you know, take care of myself, I'm going to, you know, do what you, you know, be compliant with the program. So these are, the, these are important roles. Some of it can be done by technology, I think some of it can be facilitated by a person. Just because we're using technology, like I said earlier, you know, we want to, we're not re replacing people with technology, we're just having the technology do the, you know, do the sort of automated stuff and then have the time that you spend with patients listening to them, right? Listening to them, going deep, really caring about them and not just being an information gatherer. Um, and then non-clinical, there's community outreach, community education. You know, if you can find yourself a health coach who does great talks and can sign people up in your events that we were talking about just before lunch, that's a nice thing to have, a ni nice tool too. So the thing that I like about the health coaches is that there's a lot of people that realizing that they hate their jobs and they want to get involved with something that's like truly valuable to humanity. And I think that the medical profession, even the naturopathic profession, is coming around to the fact that this is a slightly different type of provider than they are. They don't feel threatened by it. But you can become a health coach in like a year. So, you know, it, we need, it's, it's going to be hard to scale up integrated medicine or functional medicine or otherwise if you have to go through a two or three year training process to do it and then you have to learn. It's like how quickly can we get there? So the health coach is a really important part of it. So let me talk about some different provider teams and just show you how health coach is being used. So Frank Lippman, we, fo we focused him on the first ever um, Evolution of Medicine Summit. He now has two doctors, for a long time just one, but two doctors, seven health coaches. That's all the practice is, there's no one else. There's no other integrated, this is a provider, integrated provider team, but it's just health coaches and doctors. So he does the first appointment with people, or they do some of the intaking stuff. The follow-up appointments are 15 minutes with Frank and an hour with the health coach. Always a longer appointment. But all the stuff on like, are you being, you know, how are you going to learn to cook like this? How are you going to get on your paleo diet or whatever Frank is recommending? You know, they're the ones that are going to help to facilitate. If you call up and you have a question, you speak to the health coach. You don't speak to Frank. Frank's got his time very well organized. And when he's not doing the new patient consults or he's not doing the acupuncture, which is the stuff that he likes to do, he's very, very regimented with the time, but people are having a long experience. And Frank, one of the things that you have to do if you want to run this model, you have to speak well about your health coaches at every opportunity. Frank, every time he's in public, every time he's anywhere, he's gushing about his health coaches. Because what you don't want is the patient be like, well, I don't want the stinking health coach. I want you. I'm paying, you know, that that's a lot and I hear people that comes up so you have to be very sport so the time management and the practice communication are really important Robin here uh, for uh, Parsley Health right these health coaches are in Frank's office so he's in New York these these health coaches are not in Robin's office they are running the um, they're the health coach, they're doing the virtual work from home. They're also running the community events. So they're like, they're partner with a restaurant, they'll do a farm to table dinner for members, they bring them in and they're there supporting out. There's no front desk, so they're not, you know, they're not playing uh, the front desk role, but they can, you know, take care of some of the questions that would traditionally be taken care of at a front desk. She doesn't have a front desk person. Here's Jeff Glad, and um, he's, a, he's a smart dude, and I love his team. So what he found is that he initially had a doctor. He was a doctor, and then he had a nutritionist, and he would say, you have to see the nutritionist if you see me. My fee's 250, and the nutritionist is 100, and what happened is people wouldn't book on with the nutritionist because they didn't have the system in. So then he just goes, well, the ho okay, now to see me it's 350 and it includes the nutritionist and now everyone sees the nutritionist. So it could be a subtle tweak like that that is the difference between you having an integrative team and you thinking you have an integrated team but not really having an integrated team. And so, you know, think about whether it's going to be part of the program, it's going to be outsourced and the compensation structure. What Jeff's done really well is, is found ways for the people that work for him to, who are entrepreneurial to build like an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial kind of program. So he had one of his nutritionists who wanted to be an entrepreneur. He had them create like a nutrition program for all of the patients where she was getting paid over and above just her hourly rate and it sort of gave her an opportunity to build something within the practice structure. So who does the intake? Who supports the, the behavior change? You know, we were talking here about like ways that you could offer this kind of care to, you know, people without disposable income, right? Content, free. 
You can deliver content on how to get yourself healthy for free to everyone. Free, high value. Community, almost free. It's going to cost you something to get a room, to get people in, in a room together. But creating community is, is cheaper, is cheap compared to a one visit. And then coaching, cheaper. These are all things that are not medical. But these are all things like some people could get themselves well if they only knew what to do. Some people would know if they, had, if they knew what to do and they were surrounded by supportive people that had already done it. And then some people are going to need the hand-holding of a coach. And then I'll put doctor over here. Some people are going to need an accurate diagnosis. But if you can start from here and move up, people will, all, everyone will get well and people will self-select themselves into the cheapest place. So if we, you're talking about working with people with the underserved, you know, a lot of the people underserved you know, have no idea that it's even possible to get well using anything apart from traditional medicine. So you need to provide some content here that communicates that, that they can listen to for free. Then the next step could be to come into a community type of structure where they can have that message of the content reinforced and be able to talk to people who have actually gone through the same process. And if that structure is not allowing for them, then you can have some coaching uh, and the support. So that's, that's, I would just think about these three things as ways that you can put these three things in front of your provider team to be able to add value above their dollars so that they're ready to sign up for the practice. Okay, so let's talk about this. So Dean Ornish, you guys know him. So I mentioned him earlier, intense cardiac rehab, 72 hours of care on Medicare and insurance. Very few hours delivered by the doctor. So I think it's 72 hours that they pay for. It's like 7,400 bucks on Medicare, so it's over $100 an hour. Um, they do it only in groups. So you don't have to pay, you know, if you've got 15 people in a group and it's $100 an hour, you're making $1,500 for an hour of yoga. You don't have to pay the yoga teacher $1,500, right? You can see the arbitrage there and Dean's taken him a long time to work out the model, it's still not spreading that quickly because the only way that they'll pay you $7,400 as a provider to do this is if you have someone with heart disease. And the only people that have a massive panel of people with heart disease, cardiologists, not every cardiologist is on the Dean Ornish bandwagon, but you can see what this looks like. In order for him to make this a thing where it was available on insurance, he had to work out the team, he had to prove that it worked and track the outcomes, and then make it easy to deliver. Scott Shannon, we featured his work on the forum uh, in February, although he wasn't on it directly, but like this is not just cardiology, this is going to be for every every specialty. So imagine if we could have an Ornish type story of a really, you know, totally proven type of thing that came from Australia. Wouldn't that be cool? You know, a way that it came from Australia. So he's got integrative psychiatry, psychiatrists, naturopathic doctors, biofeedback and coaching, a team. They have a Chinese medicine person too. And they speak together in teams, completely integrated. And, um, you know, I would love to see innovation in the specialties. I would love for it to come from integrated medicine. It may come from Verta Health and those kind of technologies bring it together. But these are teams that are happening and things that we can we'll look, at, look at as good examples. So that's, those, those will give you some ideas about the group, about the um, the, the teams, and I would say that the most important information that I want to deliver is I think that someone has to be responsible for the behavior change. Someone has to play that coaching role, and it probably shouldn't be the doctor because it's too expensive, and it's going to put too high a barrier on, uh, on patients. So let's talk about group structures. So the first group structure that I want to talk about is actually a group structure that would happen way before a practice started, or it could happen when there's going to be a serious iteration in the practice. So Dr. Pamela Weibel, um, who's a who's very uh, smart lady, frustrated with being in primary care, thinking, you know, she's become big, talking about physician suicide, but she was, you know, frustrated and one day she's just like, okay, I hear enough from patients, I want to hear what they want. So she set up this kind of thing, town hall kind of environment, you can see right there. And just asked a group of people ahead of time, what do you want in a medical practice? What could I provide that would be better than, what are your problems doing that? The first thing she did is ask, she asked them, and people would say, I want to spend more time with my doctor. I want to have a doctor that knows my name. I want, I want, I want, whatever they want. 
And then all she has to do is to facilitate what they wanted. So they wanted to spend time with the doctor, fine. They want to have evening appointments that aren't during work, fine. She doesn't even like getting up early in the morning, right? So then she's like, okay, well, okay, if I provided this all to you because you've told me what I want, would you be willing to pay $50 a month, $100 a month for access to this kind of care if we provided it. If you ask someone what they want and then you make it for them, they're going to say yes. That's pre-selling, right? They're, you know, you're pre-selling them into saying yes. So I think the first step in serving any new community should be to go in and, and ask them what they want because you're by asking, you're doing something that no other medical practice has ever done. No one gets asked. They just get shuttled into the system. And so this is a great starting point if you're going to do any sort of transformational uh, work in the practice or if you're starting a practice start by asking people and maybe start by getting the people in the room a good thing to do would be to pick 10 or 20 community leaders that would have access to a big pool of people that you know, like for instance ask every CrossFit owner in the thing to come ask them what they're looking for and then they'd be like wow I just had this amazing experience where the doctor asked me what kind of medical practice we'd like to see and now they're building it I'm going to share it with all of my community so think about that as an, as an opportunity there um, okay second thing is group visits now group visits are uh, quite a lot of work because there's a privacy component, because it's actually a medical visit. Um, but you can take a group at a time. There's a, one of the guys who's running, you know, who's talking about this most is this John Wardle. Do you guys know him? He's from Sydney, he's a naturopath. Group visits always start as a resource constraint. It always starts with the fact that, like, these people can't afford it, or um, we've run out of doctors for this week, let's just get all the diabetic people and see them in a group. And what happens is it starts with scale and affordability, but what you end up is you end up getting a lot of synergistic interactions between the participants, you get the accountability and vulnerability of a group. So you see it starting to gain ground. Terry Walls says, by doing it as a group, you have that cross-pollination, the insights, the aha moments. Now that I've done it as a group, I'll never do it individually again. That is powerful. This is about someone who's, you know, this is someone who, you know, is, is facilitating groups uh, of people reversing their MS. Now, one thing I was, I was just talking to uh, Pauline from Victus last night, one, when we spoke to Terry in the accelerator and we did an interview with her, the secret source of her success is when she comes into a group like this, she has people self-select into three groups, red, yellow, or green. Red means, this is interesting, but hell no, I'm not eating green vegetables for 100 days. Two is like, oh, I could maybe be persuaded to do it, but I'm not quite ready yet, but it sounds interesting, maybe I'll start doing it by myself. And green is like, yes, I'll go 100% for 100 days, I'll be in all the way, I'm not going to eat white flour, white sugar, I'm going to eat three cups of three things three times a day, which is Terry's magic formula for whatever. She only puts the people in the Greek group who are green. No yellow and definitely no red. And she has, that's her secret formula, because she's like, people don't want to hear, you know, if you have naysayers in the group, it, the, the net level comes down. If you have everyone who's ready to go, even if they don't know what they're doing, and they, but they're just like, I've got to do this now, that group works out really well. Because people start getting better, there's a self-supporting group, and that happens over time. And we're working with Terry now to be able to create the structure, because a lot of the group structures in functional medicine that have come before were based on a one-off appointment, which to me doesn't really make that much sense. You know, the whole point is that it's going to go over a, a period of time. So you can see here sort of what this looks like uh, this graphically. The reason why I really like this and why I think people like it is like this woman scared to ask any questions, right? Is, is intimidated by the doctor, is just an introvert and so in this appointment is not going to say anything and is just going to take her medicine and do it. Whereas in this environment, she's sitting next to this guy who's a total extrovert and will ask every question until he's mentally satisfied. But guess what? She wants to know all that stuff too, right? But she's just too scared. But now this guy's helping her out. And that's the group synergy that you can't get in this kind of environment. And that's the kind of thing that gets unlocked that you probably don't think about before because you're dealing with a bell curve of personalities.
So this is, you know, I guess this is more like American cash versus insurance, but I know that more and more payers are coming around to the fact of paying for the group visit because they realize that this, you know, that if you talk about value-based care, low cost, high behavior change. If the behavior change is being facilitated by the other people in the group and not a provider, that's real value because the cost is low and the outcomes are high. So the value is high. So community, you know, the group visit is, is just takes a little bit more working out because it's a medical interaction. You have to have the right privacy stuff. You have to, you know, help. There, there's certain things that you're going to have to do. I don't know what that looks like in Australia, but I would say that that's because it's a medical event. It is going to take a little bit more thinking through, but you can charge for it and you can think about how you want to do it. Um, but I, I think it's it's definitely worthy. Community events are high value but low effort and no and pretty much no cost. So the weekly walking groups or running groups. You know, I've spoken about this at length, but now I start to see it, so it's cool. So some of our doctors who are doing the whole Eventbrite thing, by the way, where's the, what's the, there she is at the front, Ishara, came to this, how did you find out about this event here today? I googled um, Eventbrite and I looked at medical conferences in Sydney because I was here on vacation. <laughs> Yeah. Proof in the pudding. If it wasn't on Eventbrite, if, if this had been hosted on the AIMA website, I don't know how good your social media is, but it's unlikely that you would have found it. But it was on Eventbrite, and she found it, and she's here because of Eventbrite. So it was awesome to hear that because that's what we were just talking about. But I, we've seen now practitioners who every Saturday are doing their autoimmune talk or their whatever talk, and they have that locked down, and then are doing two or three walking groups a week or have someone in their office that are doing it. So now they have a full schedule on Eventbrite of all these free events. People sign up, people come to the walking group or people don't come. They're giving you their email, they're giving you their phone number and you can have someone follow up with them and see where to slot them into the clinic, give them an orientation or otherwise. You want to just have consistent flow of these new people and you can get um, those for free. So uh, walking or running groups, meet at the office, you know this is great for Australia. In some parts of America, you know, can we have snow half the year so you can't do it but like here you know this could be something going on on the whole time I uh, think about the weekly grocery store tours you know it takes a lot to train someone to work out where the healthy stuff is in the grocery store in America you don't go in the middle you just go around the edge I don't know if it's the same like you know but it's probably the same here so you know imagine giving that kind of tour you want to create remarkable experiences, experiences that are interesting. The word remarkable is the right word to use because it's so interesting that you would remark on it. Nothing's more remarkable than a doctor or a health coach taking a group of people around a, shop, you know, a, a supermarket and teaching them where the healthy food is and where it's not. So, you know, that's the other thing. We'll talk about this. I generally don't like business cards because it's... You know, it, it, you don't get the information of the person you want. You give out your information, but you don't get their information. That's why I prefer to have an app where you can put people into your email system and then you can email them uh, other things. But think about, you know, who would want to do this. And most health coaches, this is like their dream to do this kind of stuff. So the community, like the walking groups, there's tons of science that shows that uh, walking groups is, uh, is scientifically valid if you want to help people lower their blood pressure. Um, People have walking groups have lower blood pressure, resting heart rate, and total body cholesterol. Um, positive attitude towards physical activity, a shared experience of wellness, and people say they feel less lonely and isolated. It's a double whammy. Exercise plus community, social stress, you talk. I see this happening. I live in Venice Beach, California. I see these walking groups all the time. How do I know they're not a walking group or just random people? They're all wearing the same hat. So they all come and they all do their thing together. It's normally churches, again, that does it. Community food preparation, we talked about earlier. This is uh, Dr. Sachin Patel. This is Dynamite. He only does this for his new patients. He doesn't use this as a patient acquisition strategy. He only does it for patients that are in the practice already. But he gets them into groups. They all make the meal in 20 minutes. Uh, in 90 minutes, they make 20 meals. Everyone's making a meal each. They split it up into different groups, make it social, make it easy, encouraging uh, ongoing community. Again, this is stuff that we have an interview with Sachin in the accelerator, and he takes you through exactly how he does it, where to get the Tupperware, what company he uses and organizes it. So, you know, we we, we have uh, structures if you want to do that. Um, community support. So I want to talk a little bit here about um, this plant-based nutrition group. Again, it's another group setting. 
If you're secretly an activist, you want to lead your community, if you can position yourself as the founder of the plant-based nutrition support group in your area or the whatever group you want to be, you can go and develop partnerships and collaborations in a way that you can't where you're maybe just a doctor in private practice. So it can open new doors uh, for you if you want to do that. It's a non-threatening introduction. Think about what your passion story is. So I spoke at the uh, Functional Medicine Coaching Academy graduation and we did these hot seats where people got to come in and sit with me and say, what shall I do? Here was a nurse who had trained as a health coach who had recovered from an autoimmune disease. Right? So I was like, wow, that's a powerful combination, those three things. Nurse, retrained as a health coach, but, and had recovered her own autoimmune disease. So I was like, why don't you start an autoimmune disease support group in your community? She hadn't built a practice yet. She didn't know what to do. And so like, she's you know, starting off by building that. You can do these kind of things. If you have a job and you're looking to switch into doing integrated medicine, these are things that you can do before you quit your job. There's a great, actually there's a great book called Before You Quit Your Job by Robert Kiyosaki, the same guy who wrote Rich Dad, Poor, Jet, Poor Dad, and what he talks about is learning how to make sales before you go into being a, be an entrepreneur, but this is the same kind of thing. Before you make the switch, you could either be seeing people on the sides on a Saturday to learn the skills and build a bit of a you know, confidence with the clinical side, or you could just be building a community. You want to make sure that you're going to have many choice, many opportunities to interact with new people when you start. Okay, and then this is, the, this is what I was talking about earlier. So the group education, this is what I was talking about with the Eventbrite and Facebook integration. So a practice orientation, you might call it something, you want to call it something sexy that people want to come into. You have to mess around with the names to find, but we found like the six overlooked causes of autoimmunity. You know, you can get in there and you can deliver the kind of information that you'd be delivering anyway. What are the things? Environmental toxins play a role. It's, you know, you could have the same people with the same environmental toxins and gut issues get different autoimmune diseases depending on their genetic makeup. So one person will turn into RA, another person will turn into colitis, but it's the same inputs. So you've got all of these different, you know, things that you could talk about. You get to tell your story perfectly every time. You get to bring people into a group. The, hardest, the highest ROI for a practice is recruiting in new patients. Like, you don't want to not do this. This is your entrepreneur ROI. Because if you know that the average lifetime value of a patient in your practice is X hundred or X thousand dollars, recruiting people in is the number one most important priority if you're an entrepreneur. And you build community from day one. I highly recommend that when you're doing a group practice orientation event, again, you get people to talk to each other, you start the process of, of interaction uh, with the group so that even if they don't become a patient, they get value out of the event, the value goes up, they're more likely to tell other people, they get to meet other people, new friends in the community that care about the same things, and you're creating positive, uh, positive action into the community. So again, here's the, the patient acquisition funnel uh, that, we, that we talked about earlier. All right, so um, here are some, some ideas here. I hope it's got the ideas ticking of like what you want to do, how you want to do it. So I want to bring up now um, a team of, of doctors and practitioners who are building these integrative teams. And um, what I want to do is I want to come around with my mic and I would really love for you guys to think of some questions to put to these people because these are people that are actually doing it. So, you know, I'm more of like a, a reporter type guy where I see what's going on. I say, hey, look, this is happening. This is interesting. You should pay attention. But if you are thinking of building a team and you want to work out what that team looks like, let's ask someone who's actually doing it. So, um, Penny. And uh, I, you, you've got the rest of the, the squad, but let's have a round of applause and you come up. <laughs> All right, you've got a couple of mics there. Okay. Ren, maybe I can start with you. Um, I would love to just ask from your perspective, and um, maybe we can, I could turn this down. I'll turn this uh, off. Um, no, it's all right. You, can, you won't have to be blinded anymore. <laughs> okay. Let, let's just talk first about the clinical value of having having a team. Can we start there? Because I think I think we can talk about the, the you know the the efficiency value. But let's just start with that. Do you want to just speak to that from your experience in the clinic? Grab sure. the mic there. So I guess the clinical value, um, and it's it's the vision that I had when I first started the centre is. 
working in silo, there's an awful lot we learn from coming to conferences, but it's when you sit with a team and you work with a team, the shared information and the shared knowledge that accrues daily, the growth is astronomical and the clinician I was 18 months ago to the clinician I am today after starting the Health Lodge, we're miles apart and it's because I share the knowledge of other equally dedicated practitioners. Um, so the, the growing is phenomenal, but in that, identifying the underlying cause with chronic health conditions can sometimes take years. Um, but in, a, in a, an integrated environment, sometimes it can take a couple of weeks. And it's just about throwing these ideas on the table, looking at it from different perspectives, and just coming up with ideas that you on your own could not have come up with. So I think the model um, of practitioners working together sitting together, sharing case histories together is the future of medicine and what we're achieving is blowing us all away. Just as a follow up to that, what percentage of your patients get that sort of like grand rounds um, time between all of the heads in your group? Is it just the tougher ones or is it the one you can submit ones that you feel aren't moving along or you need help with or is it everyone? Yeah, no, it's mostly the tougher ones. So the inpatients, so we have an inpatient facility, so all inpatients get the grand rounds. Um, but it, clinicians can bring individual patients to the table, like Marcus brought one on Friday. Uh, it was a great case and the information that came out from it, he'll take back to that patient and so we don't all necessarily need to see the patient, but in terms of the case being put on the table. So it can be individuals, uh, if I was to answer a percentage, I'd go... 20%? 20%? That seems yeah. reasonable. Yeah, 80% you know what's going on, you have a clear path towards yep. success, and yep. then there are others that are a bit more murky. But within that 80%, they might be seeing two or three patients on the team, and then we'll have our little corridor consultations where we'll touch base or we'll leave each other notes. Great. So 100% are being seen by m more than one practitioner on the team, okay. and maybe 20% are seeing five or six of us. Interesting. Penny, you know, you don't have a micro practice now, you have a macro practice, but you're, you know, sort of innovating in, in the combination of people that you want patients to see. Can you talk about sort of like the, the development of, of that and, and where you see it going from here? Yes, yeah, so I, I mean, I would say every, uh, reiterate everything that Ren has said, that we learn an enormous amount from each other and over 13 years have done so much into referring that we have a really good idea of who needs to go and see which practitioner. Um, but we found uh, that our doctors got so full that that was the funnel that was really difficult for us and so when we got in a couple of new practitioners, uh, naturopaths and a nutritionist, we decided that we'd start doing group consults which evolved kind of pretty naturally but then when we found we wanted to take it to the next level it was just that those practitioners had a great affinity for each other and to take it to the next level and then um, educate and mentor new practitioners into working together you know does take some time so we've been working on that so the model is that they come in and they see a, um, a health coach who's often also what we call an integrative nurse and uh, they take the initial history from them and uh, do some initial obs they present that to the naturopath or the nutritionist who does their naturopathic or nutritionist history um, and then then the doctor comes in, gets briefed, and then the three of us sit in a room together, and the people are just overwhelmed that three practitioners would see them all at once, and that our combined knowledge, um, you know, it, it makes, like Ren would say as well, kind of huge jumps forward. Um, and we thought that maybe we'd lose the intimacy in this kind of um, consultation, you know, because there's that certain intimacy of the one-on-one -on -one when you're really listening, but sometimes it actually goes even further, even quicker. And uh, so we found that we, we don't lose anything in that group consult, but we gain a lot. Awesome. And, yeah, and so we're, we're looking at training up teams uh, to work together. That's great. Kylie, I know you're, you're very much involved with sort of helping the, the organisation of, of these kind of teams and working with practices. When, when practices are considering this type of switch, are there certain things that they typically like don't think through all the way while they're, as they're starting to build through these structures? <laughs> I can't imagine there is, but you know, there might yeah. be. <laughs> I guess, I mean, my, my interest is you know, how to make it work as a business model. And so it's looking into those things. And what I find is that so many practitioners undervalue what they offer. 
and shifting doctors from bulk billing or small gap payments to actually valuing the tens of thousands of dollars they've put into learning new things, the thousands of hours, having able to value themselves appropriately is important. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm looking at developing a membership model, and I'm looking at. Um, I guess, you know, I can't have all the people that I refer to under the one roof because there's lots of different modalities that I'll refer my patients to. So it's about how to develop an affiliate system or other ways to integrate with other practitioners. As AIM, we're looking at how to really um, educate other practitioners to do proper referrals so that we can share information. So I'm trying to look at other ways to get a model to work that is financially viable to a patient but which also provides remuneration to somebody so they're you know, prepared to go there. Absolutely. Nicole, you know, I know this is, uh, I, I just want you know, to come to you. Uh, what's been your experience with, um, you know, with working with, with other providers and where do you see that the, the value can really be, be generated for starting a new, a new clinic? Um, I'm probably just going to ditto what everyone else has said. Um, I remember when I was um, starting general practice and I was only about six months into it and very quickly I realised that I wasn't really healing anybody and um, and I often tell people with my story that the this, I was handing out either scripts or tissues and the tissues were often more effective than the scripts. <laughs> um, so then I you know, developed this idea of working with teams and like Ren said, um, it's it's the um, it's the connection with the people in the building where I find the most value. Um, I was at a conference last weekend and a, a person trying to start out said to me, um, uh, where do you go when you want to start integrative medicine? What conferences do you go to? And I told them and then I said, but actually after I've done those conferences, the next place I go to is my lunchroom because... Um, <laughs> um, because uh, it's that kind of, you know, picking the people around me and that has happened kind of congruently with other people in the team um, that's created value. And, and then once, I guess, um, because I'm in a team of people that I can connect with, then that kind of sense of connection within our team then flows on to the patient, particularly when we're in that room. I mean, like Penny, we were a bit concerned that if, you know, the patients want to see me, and so when I'm full and booked up for 10 weeks and I've got to leverage my time, we came up, we came up with this model of less time with me, more quality time with the wonderful people around me. And, um, and the concern was, is that going to you know, detract from that connection with the patient? But in our experience, it hasn't. It's um, because we have the connection within our team, um, it's almost, it's more than exponential. Beautiful. All right, let's, if you have questions, we'll, we'll come around to them. I just want to, while, while I'm going to go on that question, maybe for any of you to answer, how do you, this is a big question, like how do you deal with what's been the best strategies to empower the patient to realise that they're going to be better taken care of by a team than just by like the celebrity doctor. What's some of the things that you've done to, to you know, to calm those fears that they don't, they feel like they're above a health coach or whatever other provider you're putting in their way. I think it, it's almost like that they just need to come in and experience it. It's really hard to explain how that's going to be useful for them. And we actually did some market research uh, with two groups. One, a group that had already been through this new model and one, a group that, it, that hadn't. And certainly um, there, there were some questions about what what value were they getting from the health coach. But I guess for us, um, we've got a wait list of, it's crazy, you know, 400 people who are desperate to get in with, with all kinds of conditions who are really suffering a lot. And if their way to get in to see the doctor is through this model, then they're going to do it. You know, and then when they come in and feel the cohesion in the group, get those calls in between visits from the health coach, helping them to, to actually stick to their treatment plan and encouraging them, I guess they start to see the value. And then it's word of mouth, you know, people are going, you know, went to this new model and it was really fantastic. And, and the, the people who hadn't been through the model, uh, you know, they, they, could, they could see the value in it, but the huge frustration out there is that people have no one to go to or have a sense that they've got no one to go to. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, I think it was Kylie actually that made the point regarding uh, doctors 
or practitioners undervaluing themselves. That's often something that I've thought about a lot uh, and sometimes I think I'm guilty of that myself. But I also think that a lot of those thoughts um, sort of pertain to how I imagine patients or clients to be perceiving the value themselves. In other words, you know, in a system where that's so heavily driven by Medicare and there are sort of bulk billing practices versus non-bulk billing practices and, um, you know, I might see someone and they might hesitate to pay the second time that I've seen them, for, ins for instance, to pay a gap. All these sorts of ideas I feel are... Uh, are roadblocks for me to sort of make take that next plunge where I start to ascribe more value to those to those sessions, um, and in particular with some of the stuff James was saying about membership, you know, sort of approaches or packages and so forth. Do you have any sort of ideas about how to best, I guess, get past those 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 blockages, either if it's in my head or in the practice itself? I think it, it absolutely is a personal journey. Like what we can charge is really down to how we do value ourselves and money is just that unit of currency. And I think that um, the more you believe that you can help the patient, the more you can sort of back yourself to do that. So I, I mean, I, I take the approach that I've got expert care, um, expert new, um, knowledge, which I've gained over, you know, years of doing this and that I can actually really make a difference in that person's life. So I do value what I do in that sense. Um, I think that it's it's complex when it comes to money and people, you know, what we value ourselves at and what they perceive, but I was saying at lunchtime that it's it actually creates a bit of a perfect storm for change in that we're hard to get into, we are experts at what we do, they do have to pay more money for us, and they've often tried everything else, and so they come to us really primed to engage with this process and to be successful, and that's powerful. You know, that's really powerful. So you're actually facilitating a process in that sense. And if we, if we don't earn enough money and we burn out through that process, we're not serving anybody. So it has to be a mix of all of those things. And I'll, I'll never apologise for the fact that I charge what I charge because I know that I can make a difference in that person's life. That said and done, there are, you know, I have a handful of people that I choose to bulk bill. It's up to us as an individual what we want to do with that. And I have a concession rate. And I'm certainly happy to refer them to, you know, my other colleagues that do naturopathy or other things and they can start there. So at the end of the day, I agree, like, we want to be at the tip of the, the, the iceberg that we see the people that don't get well from all the other things mm -hmm. because then we can actually offer the value that we can offer and I don't want to spend all these consultations doing very basic things from my perspective that aren't my expertise when many other people can do that as well, if not better. So when they come to us, they're really investing in something that we can offer as an individual. One more thing. Uh, you have to realise the, the currency that they have to put into multiple consults where nothing's changing. So those people could be going to a bulk billing centre and they could be presenting and representing and representing it's their time. They're not getting anywhere. They're more likely to be put on medication, right, which is a real cost to them, maybe not financially if they're getting some help with that, but and, and it's being subsidised. But they're also getting sent to specialists and every specialist in my area charges 300 bucks per visit per 10 or 15 minutes, right? And they may not get any questions answered. So they're much better coming to us and spending whatever it is you charge and whatever discounts you may or may not offer. And, and maybe you're seeing them more intensively for a bit. And then you get to the stage where it's like every six months, once a year, they've got real autonomy in their healthcare. It's like you've saved them huge in every way and they've got more capacity. They're less vulnerable and they've got a much greater capacity. So it's all in, it, I mean, that's the truth of the matter really. But i just add to that, it, it, our patients are hurting financially. If they've got a chronic health condition, they're not able to work, there's not a lot of funding, there's a little bit of private health rebate in there as well, um, and, and it, is, it is hurting them. And so, you know, I do feel as, as clinicians we are often wanting it to go well for them as quickly as possible and those patients that you start to unpack it and it's much, much bigger than you thought it was going to be and six months later they're still visiting you weekly and they're hundreds and hundreds of dollars out of pocket and they become resentful because of all this money out of pocket. It's a difficult equation and it's never comfortable and I think it's where the membership model, we've absolutely got to look at it. We've got to work out how to implement it in our clinics mm -hmm. um, because I think the public will be much happier with that model. Absolutely. Question? Yeah. Um, over a course of our long history and spoke models of healthcare, 
what we're suggesting here and certainly in research internationally, suggesting that um, integrative care and medicine is leaning more towards um, uh, collaborative care and not so much hierarchy. Um, so I'm hearing and have um, understood that REN certainly has been successful in that um, integrative collaborative model, but so far I don't um, think I've read any research or understanding of any sort of integrative medicine clinics here in Sydney or in most of Australia to have that non-hierarchical model of healthcare and I'm just wondering um, when we hear the comments of, you know, um, medical practice and GPs at the tip of the iceberg and, you know, um, there's that, that aspect. I'm just curious, how are we going to overcome that um, image of GPs being at the very top where we're looking at integration really being more collaboration and a sharing of, of knowledge across all healthcare professionals? Big question. <laughs> <laughs> Ren handed the mic to me for that one. <laughs> you answered that. Um, hmm. I think the only way to do that is for us to get out there. We just have to pioneer it. Um, I work in a, in a building that um, that is uh, flat in terms of um, clinical care, you know, I don't see myself as hierarchical and there are the people around me are, are in, crucial to me being able to do my job. Um, we've talked for many years about trying to research this and um, and uh, report on patient reported outcomes because certainly anecdotally we see excellent patient uh, outcomes compared to what I presume is you know other um, I'm only being I'm being presumptuous but I, I guess I'm being presumptuous because I hear the patient say well I went there 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 and now I'm better um, so I don't think there is an easy answer except for us in this room to stand up and do it and and say um, you know, here we are, he, here's my experience as a general practitioner working with a fabulous team of practitioners around me and these are the patient outcomes and certainly Jen and I are on a bit of a mission to try and get some um, research uh, out there in the medical community um, and some published data but in terms of the general public um, I, yeah, I think we just have to do it and get it out there. And it is, you know, when we, when Invitation to Health first opened, um, people thought we were a day spa. So they used to come in and, you know, they thought... And then we kind of got more of a name as being a medical centre. And now within the community and, and you know, within the region, there's, there's word of mouth that we're... A, an integrative medical centre um, working as a team. So it's, ta it's a journey, um, but um, like I think the, the beauty of the functional forum and what we're doing here is there's no need to reinvent the wheel. You know, we don't have to all, we can all do it a little bit differently, but let's, you know, um, collect our knowledge and collect our failures and our successes to scale it up and, and get it out there because it's, in my opinion, um, the most effective way to manage chronic disease. How'd I go? Can I add one thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just one thought um, in terms of hierarchy and um, if you stick the patient at the top of the hierarchy, it works. And so every clinician that's involved, if they are wanting to work in a patient-centred model, the patient's at the top of the hierarchy, not the clinician. Yeah. Hi. That was me, Penny. Sorry. Oh, you go. And I was just going to say maybe after um, Jen Hunters, who is here, might explain one of the projects we're doing with AMA to help increase uh, communication between practitioners, GPs and other practitioners, because I think that's also really important. Uh, I met a, a young naturopath who very naively and very cleverly was writing a letter to every doctor of every patient she saw. And, you know, some doctors ignored it and some patients went, wow, look at the results, this is really neat, and started referring to her. So I think that the communications is really, you know, key, and that's one of the projects that um, Jen has been working on for for Emma. Sorry. No, thanks. I was just going to, if I may, as a health coach and a consumer representative, and also as a media person, I speak to lots and lots of people, add 
quickly to answer to you that you asked before that in order to change that paradigm we as practitioners who whatever we're doing need to value ourselves in that place we need to value what we can offer to our clients we need to value the benefits of what we're offering that we know deep down inside so it's really an internal thing we can't be looking outside at GPs to say how am I valuable to you I can say I'm very like you said I'm valuable and here's what I can offer both to my client and to other practitioners around me so I think really it's an internal thing um, but I wanted to ask um, along the same lines of the cost for clients because I find it very um, frustrating as a health coach to when I'm referring clients to see doctors and other things when it's really expensive it's very difficult for them because when they're seeing me it's affordable in the long term I've got plans I tell them in advance it's going to be six months or three months that it takes time at least 10 or 12 sessions and the amount that I offer them a discount if it's too expensive and they can see the it's easy for them but when I say go to see this doctor or specialist where it's three hundred dollars or um, you know hundred and fifty dollars to see a naturopath and then they have to see that naturopath three or four times and then they as well see the doctor and as well I'm feeling the frustration both from myself that I have to offer that to them that that's what I've got to offer I mean and from them when they do when they're weighing it up in their health care plan in the long term they're suddenly seeing a thousand dollar mark instead of in one go kind of thing instead of seeing like this I love this model of care of um, the membership and I really would like to see that more available because then I can just just go to that beautiful clinic over there they've got 10 different practitioners I mean if I'll be involved or not it doesn't matter to me because I still see my clients and I still want to make sure that they're healthy and so if they're with me that's great but if they need extra help and a team of experts that can kind of work them through until health coaches are more incorporated into into Australia because they're not very much so at this point but um, that they have that they're not looking at this major overhead like major expense that is deterring them from even just making that first call so I'm just wondering um, how likely are you to implement um, that kind of model of care and what would be stopping you from doing that um, or could, could you offer it alongside what you're doing now as another as an option and see if it works for some of the clients Yeah, so um, uh, how, off, how likely? We'd like to think highly likely. Um, we're certainly moving towards that. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a journey and a stepwise process. So we've morphed that model that we have with the natu um, health coach, nutritionist, naturopath and doctor into more of a package um, now and then then it's a small step to kind of then dividing that package into a weekly cost and then we're looking at exploring different providers we could put into that package so at the moment it's very kind of gut and hormone based so is there a different package we could do for chronic pain or a different package we could do for um, anxiety or depression um, something like that um, so I think in my mind, it doesn't seem too far away, um, but uh, obviously, you know, we've spoken about this at ITH for two years now, and it's not like we were like, oh, well, we can just kind of do a little bit and then and call it a membership. It's not like that, is it? You're going to have all the service offerings around it, and and certainly other service offerings we're exploring putting into it, you know, group consults or, you know, like James was saying, uh, connections with local community, the, a gym or, you know, an organic fruit and veggie supplier, you know, stuff like that. It just takes time to build the relationships and nut the plan out. And I'd have to say for us, I mean, time is a rate limiting step. Um, we're busy with limited resources. And the other rate limiting step is... T um, back-end processes, you know, medical practices are not built um, to have patients pay on a membership basis. So blending Medicare with bi private billing and then distribution of those fees coming in once a month to the practitioners is probably quite a step we'd need to look at. I just wanted to, I saw an article in the newspaper, I think it was today or yesterday, 72% of Australians are thinking to ditch their private health care cover because 
I didn't read the whole thing, but I read the thing, and I'm assuming that it's because they're not getting the value. They've got Medicare, which covers, you know, a lot of basics and is wonderful, and then they've got some of them have got on top of that private health insurance, but yet they're still not getting the care that they need. They're obviously still not fully satisfied. So I'm wondering if you could offer, regardless of Medicare, not even connected, and you can tell them, with this $150, you're not going to get rebates, there's nothing, but this is what you are going to get, extra, blah, 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 blah. And if you don't want that, we've got this other model of care. But And then you can trial it alongside, and you don't have the, of course, I mean, like you said, it's time and effort and the back end and all of that kind of stuff. I've, I've run businesses before and I know that it takes a lot of time, but um, in order to eventually implement it in, um, could you do that alongside what you're doing and think about without, the, without using any other external thing, not Medicare, not health insurance, not nothing, and see how that it is affordable for you, for them. Yeah, I'm just... Yeah. Good. Is that yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, that's a plan. Right, yeah, we are here. Let's have a... Um, yeah. just, in, just in relation to where the interface between the... The interface between Medicare and privately billing or not, not involving yourself with Medicare and we exist in this system and it goes back I think to that equation that we we're talking about the value equation. And if the cost is very, very small now, in a bulk billing kind of sense, that cost is zero to patients, okay? So there only has to be a very, very slight advantage before the value go, or the perceived value by that consumer or that patient goes up and it goes, well, it's free anyway, okay? There's no cost to me, so I only need a very, very, very small kind of benefit from that. Now, there might be multiple situations where they receive no value whatsoever, okay, because they receive no benefit. But underpinning that whole system is the fact that, that a, a large proportion of general practice in Australia exists on that, on, in that equation where there is no cost, okay? And so we're stepping outside that, and that's what one of the biggest boundaries that, it is, that I feel it is. Because in, on that equation, they're already, it's, it's, it's almost like a competitive advantage because they're actually existing on no cost. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's an, we're dealing with this illusion, okay, exactly, um, to step over that for people to kind of realise that actually even though their cost is very, is very is little or none, they're actually not getting any benefit. There's a great video I'd recommend on the Functional Forum website by Tom Blue who talks about functional medicine is cheap and he talks about exactly that thing, like the only reason why this is perceived as expensive is because of the illusion of expense that's created by the fact that you pay directly and it's not through an opaque third party payer system that you don't really any see any of the prices and yeah, like Humira is expensive and $10,000 per person is expensive, you know, these kind of Th these kind of interventions are, are not, but I agree with what you said. There is that that you're battling against. But, but I would we got, say, we got, yeah, carry on. Just Sorry, we that um, th this is a public-driven movement. That it's the people that have gone. Uh, yes, it's it cost me zero, but it has zero value, and I'm in real trouble. And I need something of great value. And so it's the people that have developed this this concept. It's the community that have driven us to create these centres. That, will, and so most of the public understand that to, to get value health care, they need to pay. I think it's, it's teaching people to value their health full stop. You know, what price for your health? And, and, and again, I come back to the fact that if it costs them money, then that's also a motivator to them. But it's up to us to educate them the value of that as well. I mean, as Penny says, even just giving up their time, like <clears throat> that bulk billing equation doesn't really, you know, equate anything for their time and they can never get their time back. So the fact that, you know, if we provide really good comprehensive health care, which gets them well faster and keeps them well for longer, there's so many other factors in that equation, but it's up to us to be able to sell that. You know, you actually have to be a good marketer. You have to be able to pitch yourself. You've got to be able to back yourself and sell yourself. But that comes from a position of belief. It comes from a position of being aligned with purpose and having real potency around that. Mm -hmm. And that's worth something. One question in the back. I just wanted to ask... G'day. 
just the panel, um, how are you doing your packages with regards to Medicare item numbers and also when you're doing, say, group visits or potentially switch to a membership model, how do you, how would you run item numbers and that kind of thing alongside? Uh, so for the group visits, um, obviously you're only charging a Medicare item number for the doctor's time as that group visit, yep. Um, and if the nurse or health coach is doing anything that provides an item number, then that can be included. If you're doing case conferencing, uh, which you can do with the doctor and any other two other any other two carers for that person, there's a Medicare item number attached to that. If you do, uh, if any of them then are, don't have their own GP and are eligible for a health care plan, GP management plan. Um, and that gives them access to one of the other practitioners that you think that they may need to uh, or benefit from seeing, then you can do healthcare plans. So there's ways in which you can, you know, and very legitimately blend in those um, Medicare item numbers when there's doctor's involvement in the care. And actually, you know, we, we do really awesome GP management plans <laughs> that are patient driven and stuff. So it really, you know, you do, in doing that plan, you actually identify a whole, you know, a whole lot of stuff that you might not have covered in your consult as well, so. There's mental health plans as yep, well. mental health care. I just want to add to more of a, a observation. I just think that what, what James is talking about and the model that he's talking about, I think is brilliant. I definitely do think it's the future of medicine. Uh, I, I work for Metagenics, so I'm, I'm involved with a lot of practitioners on a very regular basis. And Ren's point about the patients hurting, I think there's a lot of practitioners that are hurting. Mm. And I think that today just plants a seed. I think today we need to take this away, we need to think about it, we need to think how could this work for me, how can I take this model and um, if you don't do it today then you might do it in two years time. Um, how do we make the change? It's just small changes at a time. It's that, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You just take small bits and you go forward and I, I really think it's the way to go. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I would say uh, being an entrepreneur is like being slapped in the face every day. And the only good thing about it is when you end up at the end, you see how far we've come, right? You see how far much progress you've had. Gillian, let me give you the mic here. Even though your cheeks are red. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, with your practice, whether you um, are the, the patient's primary care GP or whether you have the patient still has their own GP but you're part of a team and uh, for instance if I do this I would not want to be their you know um, regular GP because I've you know for various reasons but um, I'd like to work with their regular GP so they have a partnership. Um, do, what do you do in your practice? For me, it's a, it's a variety for me. So I, the patient's at the top of the hierarchy, so it's their choice. So I'm very happy to be their GP if they want to be, and for some people that's really what they want. They don't really ever want to go to a place where they don't get considered in a holistic way or be offered a natural alternative as their primary um, treatment if that's what's appropriate. And then there are other people for lots of reasons who want to have a local GP and I'm very happy for that but I also do a lot of I see a lot of people from interstate I see a lot of people from country areas and so they have to have a local GP so it's really about being part of a team with them driving who's on their team and I'm open to whatever that looks like. I think you can make the call though if you don't want to be their, their GP that's fine like you don't want to do their pap smears or some of the other stuff they can have someone else to be doing that I think the communication is really important but the only other thing I'd add is that you know there are patients who would see one of our naturopaths as being their primary point of call and that naturopath will call us in uh, or their GP in outside of the practice if they feel that there's something that needs to be attended to by the GP and um, so our naturopaths are really good at kind of triaging that and are welcome to talk to us at any time and I think that's probably quite an appropriate model as well. Sure you do too. Yeah that works well so I'm not a GP I'm a naturopath and it, the patients choose but when they choose you as their primary physician it's it's a responsibility for sure but the lovely thing about this model is it isn't all my responsibility I can go to one of the doctors and I go oh I got this back and what do I do with this and I know I've got backup so I'll never find myself out on a limb if 
like I would be if I was working in a silo practice? I will just say I generally do encourage them to have their own GP predominantly because we get so busy and so booked up that if they've got something urgent that doesn't have to be managed by me then it's much better they have somewhere that they can go for that. So I do encourage people to do that but I can't make them do that. I suppose I, well, I don't make them do that but I encourage them to do that so they've got somewhere they can go urgently if they require it. But I always say ring our clinic first because we get cancellations and we keep a, you know, a list of people to fill those slots and so quite often we can get them in fairly, fairly quickly on a cancellation. So. Yeah. The other thing um, that we're fortunate to have is um, we have GP registrars at our practice so that's often a nice way that we're, um, patients can keep us as their kind of integrative doctor yet still have their more mainstream care attended to within the same building and the beauty about that too is then GP registrars are doing mainstream care but getting exposed to integrative medicine. You know, I'd just love to come back to one of the things that I've been schooled on by, you know, one of the things I think why people like the Functional Forum is that medicine's always been kind of like an old boys club, right? Whether they put the boys in and the men there and then, you know, it's interesting to see four women on the panel, you know, moving towards this collaborative care environment. How important do you think it is that, you know, that for women to step up and lead these ideas? Because a lot of ideas of patriarchy and hierarchy, these are, these are masculine concepts. How important do you see it as, as sort of like this, for this next era that the women GPs who are maybe more intuitively in line with these kind of concepts are stepping forward into leadership like you guys. Girls. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want us to safely leave the yeah. room? Or? <laughs> I mean, I just, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on it because I just feel, it, it feels interesting to, you know, based on the questions and the answers to see that the leadership in this, in this movement is coming from women. It's interesting because I, as you say that, I realise that I've interviewed maybe 20 male doctors who haven't come and worked at our clinic and if I look at what the reasons are, um, it's either been financial, fear of being kind of targeted for doing something different, uh, not sure about where the boundaries are. Um, but we've got this, you know, we even had one, we have a retreat once a year with our whole team and we're like, you know, how do we get more testicles into this place? Because, um, yeah, but yeah, so we've had, we've found, we'd love to have, um, and we have had like GP registrars and a few other male doctors in our place and it's been fantastic for the patients as well. I think it's really important. But in terms of leadership, um, yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, I think the world's in a difficult place right now, right? And so I think that men and women need to step up together and clearly women haven't been able to step up as much as they are able to now. And um, yeah, I just, yeah, I think, uh, you know, clearly it's important and what we bring is important, but we need to really work in partnership together. Beautiful. And I think it's also, isn't it, that women can often describe things in a different way, but we need to be able to be collaborative. So it's also finding ways to explain it to people who have a more masculine approach to life in terms that they can understand. And so, you know, I do that in my consults, as I'm sure you do too, that you have to find the language for the patient. What do they relate to? What framework do they work from? And so becoming... You know, it's all about sales at the end of the day too. It's about becoming skilled in using the language for the person that makes sense to them. So I, I want to bring everybody on the journey. So it has to be appealing and attractive to anybody, but find the right language to use. Do you think that's a learnable skill or do you think that's just sort of, um, sort of like an EQ score that you either have or you don't? Oh, look, I think anything's learnable if you put your mind to it. It's all about intention and whether you value that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think you can learn it. It might not be inherent, but you can learn it. Yeah. Have any of you found uh, that there's been people on the teams that have been good at the sales aspect that is not the main provider? Because that's one of the things I've seen with, like, for instance, with the health coaches in America, where young, excitable, you know, practitioners, very excited to be on a team with doctors and ready to go out and share the gospel of their integrative clinic, and feeling empowered to do that because they are now working in a clinic that has an MD in it. Have you seen? Have you seen that in Australia? Are you ready for that? I mean, I think some of the practitioners that work in my clinic are. Uh, well, Probably at the end of the day, it's about being inspired by a vision. And I don't really think it matters who it is. If somebody's feeling inspired by a vision, then they're passionate in how they communicate that. So for me, it's not so much who the practitioner it is, it's whether they believe the vision and whether they can communicate that. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we, we've noticed we had naturopaths to begin with um, who, who didn't know how to sell their services at all, so they wouldn't rebook patients and stuff. And then we had a naturopath come in a few years ago who had worked in another medical practice, and man, she filled up faster than most doctors and was just chockers really quickly. Um, and people just felt really confident about seeing her, and um, and yeah, I think she she not only built her practice but helped to build aspects of our practice as well. And so it's probably the opposite here. We probably have a lot of great grads um, but they really don't know how to promote themselves or what we're doing and they love the vision and the idea of what we're doing but when you really drill it down they don't really get a sense of this model yet. So I think for us here in Australia it's the other way around. Yeah. And I think your reception team are often your best sales people because they're the ones that are often the front you know, front of house. They get lots of yeah. questions. So, you know, I spend a lot of time building culture and, and sort of teamwork and shared visions in, in the team so that everybody that works under the roof is really aligned and able to, you know, spread the word and, yeah, be powerful in their message. So, yeah, I stepped out of the nest of, uh, of my general practice about two years ago and I, I kind of quickly realised at that point you're not taught a lot about sales and marketing as a medical student and as a doctor. So one of the things I guess we've all got to get better at is selling this to, to Australia. You know, there's a whole, I've had a lot of conversations today and a lot of it's come around to the same thing. How do we let people know about what we're doing? That's a sales and marketing issue. So it's up to all of us when we get into our practice to learn how to be a salesperson. And this is an entrepreneurial skill. It's not something we learn at school, yeah? This is where Robert Kiyosaki and Evo Med can help us out. When we get people coming into us now, two years ago I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have rebooked them and, and told them to go and refer their friends to me. But now when they come back, they say, Doc, you've turned our kids' health around and you've done it in three months. I say, that's great. Have you got any friends that you could send to me because I want to help them? And then they all go and you, you don't need to spend a lot on marketing. You just get a few people better. You provide them a remarkable experience. You tell them to follow you on Twitter, Facebook and share your stuff. And all of a sudden we've become the dominant paradigm. And that's what every discussion here today has been around this idea of fear. And it comes back to what James said at the very first Evo Med. They set me up. He's not paid for this over here. I love that. Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's, it's, about, it's about stepping up and acting like we're winning. You've got to act like we're winning and not like you're losing. And it's that, it's that fear of, of the unknown. It's, it's that fear that, that it needs to be, be, be overcome. And it's easy for me to do it because I didn't have it drilled into my head at school for a long time. It's like, how do you know in America? Why did, you know? <laughs> I, I never pledged allegiance to the flag every day for a long time, so I think differently about foreign policy, for instance. It's the same thing here. It's like you've been drilled in all the time. This is how to do it. This is how medicine is. This is how it's going down. And then, you know, to be able to think differently. So I, I thank you for, for sharing that, and I agree. It's like if this is going to be an entrepreneurial revolution, there needs to, those skills need to be embedded. So thanks for sharing, Marcus. Yeah. We've got a couple more questions and then we're going to have a quick break and we're going to move on, but I'm glad everyone's into it. Thank you. Look, I think the integration goes a bit beyond that as well. You know, if you want to be integrated in the community, you've got to recognise that in the community you've got your experts. You've got your social media expert, you've got your marketing expert. Got, so, you know, an invitation to help. We've set up an advisory board with some people that have really good skill in the marketing come area. And we're inviting contractors to come and run our social media plan. And they feel really passionate about our medicine. So they're the best people that can actually do the job for you. Because one of the problems is if you want a doctor to do everything, the outcome is going to be average. But if you realize that, you know, from a, from a step that you've already taken, that the doctor is not just a central piece of the, of the cake, but you've got all those other practitioners running it, why don't you extend that to the specialist in marketing, com, the IT specialist? You've got to have some really functional application, you know, you're not going to be able to design that. So that, that's the next, and, and maybe in your presentation you haven't talked enough about that, I think. I think there should be, personally, I think in that room there should be half business people and half practitioners, and when those two half work together, that is going to put integrative health on the map. But if you just leave it to practitioners, it's going to go a bit slower. Absolutely. I, I just want to come back to something you said there, uh, Kylie, is, uh, 
having a really clear idea of the vision and the mission of the practice, because how do you get a marketer that's fired up about what you're doing? They need to know what you stand for. And so I think that's one of the key things that I would you know, recommend is as you build your initial team, even if it's just you and one other person, be like, yeah, what do we stand for? And one of the things that we, you know, what we do stand for will be reflected in the name of the practice. You know, it could be called anything. You know, we were talking about a village, uh, Doc over here talking about his village concept. That's the key thing that he wants to get across. It's going to take a village and everything will stem from that vision. So, you know, I, I just want to uh, bring that back to what you said earlier is that you have to have a very clear idea of what you stand for and that's a lot easier to understand who you're going to bring in and you can get people fired up in the community like I see these kind of startups that are happening in Silicon Valley are not just happening because people are are looking for ways to get rich. It's like the two tech guys that recovered from of type 2 diabetes by the ketogenic diet like oh we should do this like we should make something and there's the you know the spark that comes from it. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying and w Wait, it, what an amazing opportunity with all the patients that you've seen that have come through your practice. So what do you do? Oh, I'm a marketing person. Oh, you had a transformational thing? Well, look, pitch us. What, you know, what would it be, for, what would you do for our practice to get the word out? And then you start to engage those people. No one will be able to communicate better to other patients than someone who's been a patient. So there's that initial community that you build of the first 50, 100 patients that can be, you know, that can help you take it exponential. So I, I, I think that's a, a key point. I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you. When you start helping people, the income and the money is going to start to come in. People will tell other people, I went and saw this practitioner and, and that will start to roll on. I think one of the things that I think might help our the whole integrative practice is, and what you're trying to do is the right thing. Create a model that you can teach to other practitioners and get them together. And I, th I think a lot of it is in the private healthcare system where, you know, if we can get this coordination there, then again, it's going to roll on. So, I mean, I've been involved in this industry for 25 years now. And the interesting thing that I find is that there's 22,000 GPs in Australia. But if I look at the membership of AMA or of ACNAM, there's probably about 700 members in, uh, that are GPs. And I still find that most GPs have only put their toe in the water and we're trying to get them to dive into the pool. So whatever we can do to create a model, to teach them a methodology that would be accepted within the industry, I think that's going to make a huge difference. Thank you. Any thoughts on that? Final thoughts from the panel? Thanks so much for, you know, all of, there's been a lot of great wisdom shared. Any final thoughts related to that otherwise? Otherwise, well, I can see there's some uh, cakes that are probably not going to be eaten over there. Yeah, look, the only thing I'd say is that one, once you're doing this kind of medicine, there's no choice. You can't go back and do anything else. Yeah. You know, you know you're making such a difference. You know there's a great need. And I, I get that people are fearful, but you just have to be discerning and vigilant and passionate and slightly naive and just go for it. Yeah. And I think a lot of the fear people have is perceived fear. It's not real fear. And I would always encourage people to you know, speak of what your fears are. So people have a fear of Medicare coming after them. I can tell you, like I was asked by Medicare some years ago to explain why I did so many long consultations. And I happily explained and they were delighted. They said, oh, that's great. We want more of that medicine. You're seeing the complex people. You're making a difference. So if you're an outlier, you get asked the question. But that doesn't mean you're in trouble. It means you have to please explain. And so long consultations is not a reason to be scared. It's, it's good. It's good practice. Uh, so people get frightened for things, but they're not necessarily realities. Uh, I think it's inherent as a human that we don't like being an outlier on a herd. So when our peers are not doing integrative medicine and we feel scared that we're different, that's where as a community we have to get together and reassure each other that we're doing good medicine. You do have a herd, it's just a different one to what you thought it was. And we have, valid we have validity, we have potency. We've got an incredible message and we're changing the world, you know. Let's be inspired by each other and not be fearful, you know. As I had just at a conference yesterday and you know, the thing about, you know, I can't, for the, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, ask the question, how can I? And just switching that around, how can I help more people? How can I transform health? Yeah. Powerful. Beautiful. Look, and again, 
I just want to give another shout out for getting together regularly with other providers to have this kind of conversation. Because if you don't, if you feel isolated, and you're, if you're isolated, you're more, you're less likely to be able to go forward with the confidence that you need. Rather than if you're surrounding yourself with other people, who are like they're doing it, they're doing it, they didn't get in trouble. Those reinforcing those stories, I think, is really powerful. So I just like to say, James, there's a lot of support as well. Like when I went out on this journey, you know, I had all other integrative centres. You know, I, I spoke to them all, what are you doing, how are you doing it, every one of them stepped in and said don't do this, do this, use this format, speak to this person. So there's a lot of support if you think you're ready to go out and do that. You don't have to start from scratch, reach out because the more of us doing this, the more likely it's going to become the norm.